Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 843 for November 1st, 2020. Coming up in a few minutes. We wanted to have this project in D.C. And uh, while we were uh, searching for a name, uh, you know, all the rivers and creeks was already taken by somebody else. So we, uh, so filibuster was a name, which as, as a DC name, um, but we just never made our world on a DC. So we thought whiskey, bourbon with uh, filibuster, you can you can't go wrong. No, we're not going to talk politics on this final episode before the U.S. presidential election on Tuesday. But whiskey and Washington go way back. Remember, George Washington had his own distillery at Mount Vernon, just down the Potomac River from where the city is today. There are a number of whiskey makers in the Washington area, and the Delari family's filibuster distillery nearby in Virginia takes its name from one of the U.S. Senate's storied and occasionally controversial traditions the filibuster. I'll talk with filibusters Sid DeLauri later on Whiskey Cast in depth, along with Ali Anderson, the general manager of Joseph A. Magnuson Company, which is leaving the nation's capital to move to Michigan. I'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice behind the label, November's Whiskey Club of the Month, and He doesn't think the whiskey's worth that. Oh, no. And it infuriates him. He thinks it's worth what it's priced at. He thinks a bottle of Old Rip should be $59.99. The news is next on this edition of Whiskey Cast. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Hey, whiskey fans, I'm Gabriel Cartarella, brand ambassador for the world's most awarded blended scotch whiskey, Dewar's. You could probably guess I've got a lot of stories, but for me, the good ones have one thing in common. They're best told over a glass of whiskey. So hit pause, grab your bottle of Dewar's, and let's get back to this episode of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. And there's both good news and bad news out of Kentucky this week. While the state's whiskey exports are down by a third because of European Union tariffs and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on bar and restaurant business has cut into sales, the boom in retail whiskey sales has helped make up for some of that lost business. For the second straight year, the Commonwealth's bourbon distillers filled more than 2 million barrels during 2019, and the total number of barrels of maturing bourbon in Kentucky reached a new record high of 9,266,228. Those numbers come from Kentucky's State Revenue Department, as Kentucky Distillers Association President Eric Gregory explained. Each year, the state of Kentucky requires distilleries to report their barrel inventories as of January 1st, 2020. For, unfortunately, tax purposes, we remain the only place in the world that taxes aging barrels of spirits. So all these inventories, uh, the nearly 10 million, that's for all of the distilleries, rectifiers, bottling shops in Kentucky, any place that's got a license to store barrels, whether they're a KDA member or not. And 9.27 million barrels of just bourbon, which means that uh, you still got about half a million barrels of rye floating around out there and other stuff? Yeah, brandy. You know, we we still have a lot of brandy in the state, but rye and just other spirits um, out there. And that 9.2, 9.3 million is the first time since we've been keeping records at KDA uh, since 1967. That's the first time that the number of just bourbon barrels has topped 9 million. Now, there could have been times before 1967, but unfortunately, those records are long gone. What does this mean for the state to have this much whiskey in inventory right now? Obviously, there's a lot of barrel taxes, but... uh, what does yeah. it mean for the future for bourbon? Well, we set a record in barrel taxes, too, with nearly $30 million, and that's something we're going to continue to work on with our legislature to try to figure out a way to resolve that discriminatory tax. But it also shows the resilience of our industry. Um, you know, over the past five years, 
um, we just continue to grow by leaps and bounds um, and, and break records almost every year. But the great news for the Commonwealth is that this means more jobs and investment. Um, you know, every barrel uh, eventually becomes bottles. Um, you've got to have employees to to make it, to barrel it, to bottle it, to store it. More warehouses equals more tax revenue, which is you know used predominantly to fund education in Kentucky. Um, and it just shows that the you know the industry continues to grow and the future is bright. This is only the second time ever that we filled more than two million barrels in one year back back years of 2018 and 2019. What do you think the impact of the pandemic is going to be when we look at these numbers a year from now? I I don't think we'll see much change, honestly. Um, thanks to our wonderful governor Andy Bashir, who's done a great job of handling the pandemic. Bourbon industry distilling was declared an essential business in Kentucky, so we haven't missed a beat. Um, you know, obviously our tourism centers were impacted and shut down for a brief time, but the great majority of them, almost all of them, are reopened now. Um, but uh, I don't anticipate any any real loss in um, in barrel production or aging inventory uh, at all. But there may be some impact on uh, bottling at some point if somebody wasn't able to say pull some barrels out of the warehouses theoretically, right? Yeah, theoretically, you know, um, and, you know, we keep up with all the data and obviously on-premise sales um, have been hit hard with the closure of restaurants, and bars, uh, while off-premise uh, sales have been skyrocketing with people drinking at, at home. But um, we're going to do our annual economic impact study next year. We do that every two years. This year was the year we were supposed to do it, but we punted because of COVID. So um, Dr. Paul Coombs, who's a, a noted expert in, in uh, economics here in Kentucky, who's done every one of our economic impact studies since the first one in 2009, uh, is already on the job and working on pulling numbers. So we'll have a really good grasp next year as to how COVID exactly affected us and everything from production to jobs and uh, payroll, you name it. I assume he'll also be looking at the impact of the tariffs? Yes. Um, you know, tariffs continue just to be a, a, a huge problem for the industry as a whole, the, the entire global whiskey and spirits community. You look at the Kentucky exports in 2019, we sent about $560 million uh, worth of uh, whiskeys and other spirits overseas. And um, the latest numbers through August of this year show that we're down 32%. So um, that's not good for anybody. While the distillers had to pay almost $30 million in barrel taxes to local governments, Kentucky state law allows them to take a credit for those payments against their state income taxes. However, that and the deductions they're allowed to take for investing in construction projects and other capital investments often add up to more than many distillers would owe altogether in state income taxes. The KDA wants state lawmakers to consider changes that would allow excess credits to be either refundable or transferable to other companies within the state. COVID-19 cases are on the rise again in many parts of the world, and that is leading to new lockdowns affecting pubs in several European countries. Germany and France have already imposed mandatory pub closings, while England announced a partial four-week shutdown scheduled to go into effect on Thursday. Similar lockdowns are already in place in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, while Italy is now ordering all bars and restaurants nationwide to close at 6 p.m. each night. One bright spot, pubs in Melbourne, Australia, are now gradually being allowed to reopen after that city was locked down almost completely for the past four months. While the opening of Diageo's Johnny Walker experience in Edinburgh, Scotland, has been delayed until next summer because of the COVID-19 pandemic, work also continues on Diageo's project to upgrade the visitors' centers at 12 of its distilleries in Scotland, Glen Kinchy Distillery near Edinburgh is the latest to reopen after upgrades to its tasting rooms and tours. It's now available for tours, depending on the latest Scottish government health restrictions. There's word this week that one of Japan's historic distilleries may be revived in the new year. Not Kuruazawa, but Hanyu Distillery could be back in production as early as this coming February, for the first time since 2000. The drink's business reports Hanyu's owner, Toa Shuzo Drinks, 
is working to rebuild the distillery and resume production given the demand globally for Japanese whiskey. Hanyu was founded by Isuji Akuto back in 1946. His grandson is Ichiro Akuto, who bought the final 400 casks of Hanyu whiskey after the distillery closed and bottled them as his legendary card series. He opened his own Chichibu distillery back in 2009. Beam Suntory will pay $19.5 million to settle a federal investigation into the company's activities in India. The settlement stems from charges that Beam violated U.S. anti-corruption laws by paying bribes to officials in India between 2008 and 2012. The company paid more than $8 million two years ago to settle a civil case with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission over the same activities. The bribes date back to before Suntory acquired Beam in 2014, during the periods when Beam was both a part of Fortune Brands and after it was spun off into a separate company in 2011. And speaking of illicit activity... The Glenlivet is launching a new series of limited edition bottlings. The original stories series kicks off with the 12-year-old illicit still, which refers to founder George Smith's original illegal still in the Spey Valley. It'll be available in the UK starting later this week, exclusively through Amazon at £45 a bottle. There are plans for releases worldwide in Europe, the U.S., Asia, and Australia later on. Wild Turkey is releasing a limited edition Russell's Reserve 2003 vintage. It's unique because this 16-year-old whiskey is said to be the last of Wild Turkey's barrels that were filled with White Dog Spirit at 53.5% ABV, or 107 proof. It's bottled at 44.75% ABV, There are only 3,600 bottles available. The recommended retail price, $250 each. Bimber Distillery in London is sending its whiskeys to the U.S. for the first time as part of the new Country Collection. That's a range of 20 different single-cask bottlings produced specially for its distributors in Europe, Australia, Taiwan, and the U.S., While 19 of the whiskeys are on their way to importers now, the first release for Paris's La Maison de Whiskey went on sale last month. The Dublin Liberties Distillery is sending its whiskeys to the U.S. for the first time as well. The range includes the 5-year-old Oak Devil Blend, along with the 10-year-old Copper Alley, the 13-year-old Murder Lane, and the 16-year-old Keeper's Coin Single Malts, They'll have recommended prices in the U.S. between $45 and $160 a bottle. And we are starting to see more whiskeys now that were distilled at John Teeling's Great Northern Distillery in Dundalk, Ireland. Great Northern went into production in 2015, largely to supply bulk whiskey to other entrepreneurs. Proclamation blended Irish whiskey has been available for a while now in Europe, but is now being imported into the U.S. by the same company responsible for the Grace O'Malley Irish Whiskey. I received a sample of Proclamation this week. I'll have my tasting notes for it soon at the WhiskeyCast website. On the Canadian whiskey front, Corby is out with a new version of its Lot 40 100% rye whiskey. Lot 40 Dark Oak is aged in New American Oak, then finished in heavily charred oak casks before being bottled at 48% ABV. It'll go on sale this month exclusively in British Columbia for now, with plans to expand into Ontario in February. No word on pricing. And finally, we have a change to report in the media world. Jeffrey Lindenmuth is stepping aside as executive editor at Whiskey Advocate magazine, He's moving over to M. Schenken's flagship Wine Spectator magazine, following the departure there of longtime executive editor Thomas Matthews. David Fleming will take over at Whiskey Advocate. He's been in charge of Schenken's trade media division, including the Schenken News Daily. 
Congratulations to both Jeffrey and David. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. I hope you were able to catch our happy hour webcast Friday night. Happy Land author Wright Thompson was my guest. You can catch our discussion about the Pappy Van Winkle story on demand at our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. This week I'll be joined by Matt Hoffman of Westland Distillery and Dr. Steve Jones of the Bread Lab at Washington State University to talk about their experiments with heirloom varieties of barley that they're growing in the Skagit Valley north of Seattle and that Westland is making into whiskey. That's coming up at 5 p.m. New York time live Friday on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, along with our Facebook page, Twitter, and Periscope. Time now for the WhiskeyCast calendar of events, brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. We are starting to see a new round of COVID-related event cancellations coming in, And that includes this week's Whiskey Obsession Festival that had been scheduled for this Wednesday night in Tampa, Florida. It has now been postponed until next April, with a specific date to be announced in the coming weeks. We also have an update this week on plans for the Victoria Whiskey Festival coming up in January. As we have reported before, the 2021 festival will be limited to smaller group tastings only to comply with current British Columbia health restrictions, and there will be no large-scale tastings or dinners this year. We're sharing these details now because under normal circumstances, tickets would go on sale the first weekend of November, with ticket and hotel packages on the first Friday for those traveling from out of town, and ticket-only sales the next day at the Strath in Victoria. This year, that has changed. Ticket and hotel packages will go on sale Friday, December 4th, through the Hotel Grand Pacific in Victoria, while tickets will go on sale a week later on the 11th through the Strath's website only in order to prevent the long lines that usually form every year outside the Strath. In addition, festival organizers have also announced a refund policy in advance in case new public health restrictions between now and then force the entire event to be canceled, along with health requirements for all attendees, including a ban on attending by anyone who travels outside of Canada in the 14 days before the festival. For that reason, and because the borders remain closed, we will not be able to do our usual special coverage from the Victoria Whiskey Festival this January, but I do hope to be able to return in January of 2022. As far as events that do remain on the schedule, Tosh McGill will be leading a night of whiskey tasting at Clipper in Auckland, New Zealand on November 10th. The scaled-down Oslo Whiskey Festival is still on track for this coming weekend, along with the rescheduled Stockholm Beer and Whiskey Festival, November 26th through the 28th. Whiskey Fest organizers are still watching the situation in San Francisco, New York, and Chicago before making a final decision on the events in all three cities, scheduled between December 4th and the 11th. We could get that word at any point in the coming days. And for that reason, make sure you check with event organizers before you make any travel plans. Virtual events on the schedule include the Spirit of Toronto Festival's ongoing series of virtual masterclasses that runs all month long, including this week's sessions with Bob Baxter of Two Brewers and Yukon Spirits on Friday night and Teeling Whiskey's Alex Chasco on Saturday. Healing also has its own A Taste of Dublin 8 virtual event on Thursday. And I mentioned our Happy Hour webcast the other night with Happy Land author Wright Thompson. Well, he and Julian Van Winkle have an online charity event coming up November 16th. Tickets are available through squarebooks.com. And it includes a raffle ticket for a bottle of Happy Van Winkle. We're updating the calendar at WhiskeyCast.com with details all week long as we get them from event organizers. And we already have events throughout 2021 on the calendar. 
in the hopes that we'll be able to get together again very soon. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of Virginia's most awarded spirits. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states, three continents, and online, too. Visit the Where to Buy page at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com to find a retailer near you. And please drink responsibly. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Gabriel Cartarella again, the doer's guy. I've seen a lot in my years as brand ambassador for the world's most awarded blended scotch. Like the time I got a hold an actual letter written by Andrew Carnegie. A letter from 1891, in it asking doers to ship a keg of whiskey to President Benjamin Harrison at the White House. Spoiler alert, we did. And the bourbon folks were not too happy about it. Pretty cool, right? Well, here's another story for you. In 2019, our master blender, Stephanie McLeod, became the first woman to be awarded Master Blender of the Year by the International Whiskey Competition. And a year after that, she won it again. Stephanie's first creation for Dewar's, Dewar's 15 year, is another piece of history. Sweet, floral, with notes of honey and toffee, a perfectly balanced addition to the Dewar's lineup. It's a great introduction to scotch for beginners, and it's more than complex enough to satisfy whiskey aficionados. So grab some Dewar's 15, call some friends, and make a few stories of your own. That's what a good bottle of whiskey is all about. Whiskey Cast In Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. The area around Washington, D.C. has a unique place in American whiskey history. Not only did George Washington have his distillery for a few years at Mount Vernon after he left the presidency, but there have been distilleries all up and down the mid-Atlantic coast from Baltimore south into Virginia for the last 400 years, both legal and illegal. A few years ago, a group of investors came together to revive a historic whiskey maker's legacy when they opened up the Joseph A. Magnus & Company distillery in Washington. While most of their whiskey has been sourced from MGP and blended by the incomparable Nancy Fraley, they have slowly been expanding from state to state. This week, though, the owners announced they are relocating the entire company to Holland, Michigan, on the shores of Lake Michigan, in order to position the Magnus brand for future growth. Friday was the last day for Magnus in Washington, and that's when I talked with General Manager Ali Anderson on an occasionally noisy StreamYard call. Let's talk about, first of all, why you're making the move from Washington, D.C. out to Michigan. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have grown in the past five years incredibly fast, uh, very rapidly, from a local startup in D.C., a reestablished heritage brand, to something that's uh, kind of grown beyond our wildest dreams. Um, so, you know, when, when you grow and when you go through those changes as a company, and we've been through many of them, uh, this is the, just the next logical step to, uh, to keep us going national. But why Michigan and why move out of Washington? Is it the real estate costs in Washington? Is it uh, the market? Why make that move to Michigan? I know yeah. there's historical reasons behind it. Well, just now is the time to pursue those those significant economies of scale that we can do. Uh, you probably know that we have we have common ownership. We have a history in Michigan, um, and so that it just made sense for us to go to a place where we had history and where the the quality of craftsmanship is something that they they take seriously there in West Michigan. So it just was a good fit on a number of level, levels for us. And let's explain that common ownership. Yeah, common ownership between Coppercraft and Magnus. You're still going to be working with Nancy Fraley, though, right? Absolutely. Nancy's our favorite. Nancy is our favorite. Yeah, that that will not change. Uh, ownership doesn't change. Uh, the only thing that changes is is the view. Right? It gets gets a little more uh, a little more beautiful, if I could say. What did you learn from working in D.C., though, for the last several years that uh, you can take out to Michigan? That's a great question. You know, D.C. is a fantastic cocktail town. It was very good to us, and I, and I hope will continue to be good to us. And not just D.C., you know, the surrounding, the entire DMV, uh, the district in Maryland and Virginia. What we've learned about it is you can make great whiskey anywhere when you have great juice and good people. I think Michigan has shown that already. There's a number of great brands there. And and we're proud to, to, to be there and do that, no matter where we are. 
Let's go through the mechanics of the actual move. What all are you taking out to Michigan? So we're moving, you know, tanks. In fact, I just got to with our production guys before I hopped here. And I said, how many, how many trailers did it take? And he said, four 53-foot trailers to move all the barrels and tanks and, and just all the stuff you've got in a distillery. Everything from glassware to old bottles to inventory to barrels. So, yeah, today's a big day. But you're not distilling yet, right? And so in, in Holland, stills, right? Right. Stills will remain. Those will stay. So what are you going to do with the stills and stuff? Are you selling those to somebody else or are you going to move them out to Michigan at some point? Or are you going to start all over again out there? No, we are not taking the stills with us. There is going to be a new distillery moving into our space. Uh, I don't know much about their operational details, but they're going to make good use of that equipment for sure. I can't wait to see what they do. And so you'll start over from scratch out in Michigan? I wouldn't say scratch. Uh, we have a, a good relationship with MGP. We've used their juice since the beginning, and we'll continue to do that. And, you know, next step really is getting Nancy out to Michigan and having her walk the space. And, you know, she's she's continually blending for us anyway with samples, but we really want to get her out there and, and just get her with the barrels. But when will you start making your own juice out in uh, Michigan, or will you use Coppercraft for that if, and work with them on distilling for you? Yeah, co no, Coppercraft will co-pack for Magnus. Uh, that's you know something we're going to do for, for as long as we need to, to, to continue to stay national and continue to grow. Um, you know, as far as distilling our own stuff, quote, you know, our own stuff will continue to source from MGP. And where the magic happens for the Magnus product is in the finishing and the blending that we do to it. As long as we've got great juice, and we do, uh, then we can work with that in-house. There's a really interesting uh, distilling and cocktail community in the Washington area that you alluded to. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that you're going to miss that connection with all of the other little small distilleries in the Washington, D.C. area from Baltimore down south into northern Virginia. You're going to miss a lot of that, aren't you? Well, sure. I mean, anytime you move, whether it's, you know, with any industry or even just personally, you, you miss where you're where you're coming from. Um, but, but you look forward to where you're going to. Um, and we've had a number of uh, retailers reach out and bars and restaurants just in Michigan, you know, just this past week with the announcement. And they have been incredibly excited uh, with lots of offers to, to partner and, and just just very supportive. Right. That's what that's what Michigan is. They know what it is to stand up a brand and build something from the ground up. And so we feel very comfortable uh, being ensconced there. We know that Coppercraft has ownership and you have ownership by the DeVos family which sure. is, uh, shall we say, rather dominant in Michigan. How much of this was influenced by the family to say, let's get you guys out of Washington, move you to Michigan? You know, one of the things about Magnus is that we're made up of a variety of very diverse investors. So, you know, it was in no way the DeVos family saying, do this, right? That's, that's just not their style. Um, it was a, a collective decision with all of the investors. We, you know, we really just uh, took our time with it. And looked at it and said, this makes the most sense for the long-term future and the growth strategy of this brand. What does this allow you to do in terms of growth, uh, in terms of having extra space to store barrels, things like that, that you don't yeah. have in D.C., where space is tight? Space, you said it. Space is tight in D.C. Uh, I think, you know, in our, in our Ivy City distilling community there, I think everybody would be nodding their heads saying, yeah, space is tight. We're an urban environment. So, sure, this opens up. Uh, literally, you know, space for us in Holland. Um, so yeah, we're we're looking forward to just growing into that space. You know, um, I think brands can be like living in a fishbowl where you just kind of grow to fit the space you're in. And when you're in 33 states, you need, you know, you're making a lot more stuff than you were when you were just in DC or just in, in Virginia. So yeah, we need the space for the blending tanks, for the barrels. Uh, you know, we're making more cigar blend next year. So that all takes time and space. And that's what we need. So we've got. Explain the history that Joseph Magnus himself has in Michigan, because we knew he was based in D.C. for a while, but there's also a logical connection to Michigan, right? Yeah, so interesting. He, he actually never was in D.C., although he had uh, a number of retailers that he worked with here. Um, McKinnis Brothers was a kind of a famous one back in the day. Um, so, you know, he, he his distillery was started in Cincinnati. Also another fantastic whiskey, you know, uh, city for us as well as a state. They've been good to Magnus. 
uh, over in Ohio. But Magnus, uh, you know, in the summers, he he would go up to, to Odin, Michigan, uh, to Petoskey, and he would uh, be very active in the community there. So it was near and dear to his heart uh, as, a, as a place of respite and, and quiet and peace. That's where he'd take his family. And, uh, you know, that's that's special to us, too. Are all of your employees making the move? Are you leaving some folks behind? Uh, how's this going to work as far as your staff? Yeah, uh, we've eliminated one position through this move. Uh, so, you know, the, the staff that we've got in Holland who will continue to co-pack or start to co-pack for Magnus uh, is, is going to take over those duties. One update on a story involving Joseph A. Magnus that we first reported a year ago when the owners of Magnus filed a lawsuit against Highland Park owner Edrington and ReserveBar.com, accusing Highland Park's Magnus single malt whiskey expression of violating their trademark rights to the Magnus name. Anderson told me the case has been settled and that they were pleased with the results. A check this weekend of federal court records shows the lawsuit was dismissed with prejudice, meaning it can't be refiled again, and both sides paid their own attorney's fees. There was no comment from Edrington, which has a corporate policy against commenting publicly on litigation. One of the long-standing traditions of the United States Senate is the filibuster, the policy that a single senator or group of senators can bring the entire agenda to a halt as long as they keep talking and talking and talking. Alcohol isn't officially welcomed on the floor of the Senate, but it is safe to say that probably more than a few hip flasks have appeared in the Senate chamber over the decades. Sid DeLari and his family had that time-honored tradition in mind when they decided to start making whiskey instead of just selling it at their store in Washington, and that's led to filibuster whiskey. Where did you guys get the idea for filibuster bourbon and the filibuster distillery from? How did you uh, get into the business? So as the name suggests, filibuster. So filibuster was supposed to be in D.C. because we, uh, I come from a retail background and our family also owns a retail store in D.C., we wanted to have this whole project in D.C. That's why we named it Filibuster, to be appropriate with that name. Uh, but that just never came through, just because that when you put a project on the papers and when you start it, it's completely different. Um, because whiskey is nothing but a good water source, grain, water, grain, and yeast. Uh, and we want to be true to where we are. Uh, so that's why we never found a, a place in D.C., and we moved to Virginia uh, in Shenandoah. So that's what stuck to us uh, because we have a roots in DC and, uh, and we moved to Virginia where we think we had a great water source. We had, uh, because we, we are on a Blue Ridge mountain, which is, uh, we are on about 80 feet of limestone water. So that's, that's how filibuster name came into existence. And I assume you're working from home right now because I can hear kids in the background. Actually, uh, we are on a we are on a vacation. Uh, it's my 40th birthday, so we came out uh, with the family. Everybody's here, so you will see all the background uh, noises. And we uh, we get that; it's perfectly fine. And uh, happy birthday! Um, Thank you. Let's talk about how you moved from sourcing to distilling because you've been making your own stuff for about three years now. So, how did you make that switch over? See, the reason why we were sourcing, because we had a very thing, because I come from a retail background as well, our family, as I said. So I had a very clear vision in my mind that I don't want to come up with a whiskey which is three months old. And um, I want to go a more conventional way of aging the whiskey, which is 53 gallons. Uh, don't want to use staves, didn't want to use chips. So I had a very clear fundamental in our mind that we do not want to come up with a whiskey because as a retailer, uh, I have experienced the wave of craft whiskey, which came into the market. Um, you know, everybody did a good job, but as an end consumer, you always expect or you always compare to something which is you you have been born and bought up with. You know, you you want to try a good whiskey. You want to try a good bourbon um, with no gimmicks. With no, it, it's just a fundamental of a whiskey drinker that he wants to try a good whiskey. 
So that's why we started sourcing and we started distilling our stuff. Uh, Side by side, we were distilling and doing it. But as the project started off, uh, we were sourcing. But we had a clear that once our whiskey is about two plus years, uh, we will release our, our, our whiskey. Um, so that that was the whole thing that we would we were uh, sourcing our whiskey, but we wanted to have our 53 gallon traditionally uh, aged barrels. So that took us two and a half years or three years uh, for sourcing, and then we came into our own uh, own bourbon. Tell me about the problems you had trying to find a space in Washington to set this up, though, because I know there has been other distilleries that have set up there. One of the biggest was the real estate value um problem and the second was the space uh, because we are at the moment on a 12,000 square feet uh, area so we have a warehouse which is 12,000 plus we have a rick house which is another 10,000 every barrel is laid in a conventional way so in dc first of all it was uh the real estate which was very expensive the secondly it was the water source uh we didn't want to use a city water because um the reason why Scotland is Scotland, the reason why Kentucky is Kentucky, the reason why, you know, it, it, it is, it's, it's water plays the major role. So we, we are, we sit on 80 feet of limestone in Virginia, which is, we are blessed. Um, so that was the reason that we didn't choose DC or, or DC didn't choose us and we had to move to Virginia. Now, where did the name filibuster come from? Because uh, whiskey and politics have, been intertwined for centuries practically and uh, the filibuster is uniquely american it is it is uniquely american so as i said that we um we wanted to have this project in dc and uh, while we were uh searching for a name uh, you know all the rivers and creeks was already taken by somebody else so we uh so filibuster was a name which does it as, as a dc name um, but we just never made our world on a DC. So with our whiskey, bourbon, with uh, filibuster, you can you can go wrong. You're making all of your stuff grain to glass. Let's talk about the bourbon first of all, and then we'll go on to the boondoggler. But tell me about your bourbon. So our bourbon, um, first of all, our corn comes from our local um, our, our friend out there now. I mean, we can call them our friends uh, because we started working but three years ago with them, uh, no, but four years. So they're super good, nice, uh, you know, uh, farmers. Uh, Chuck and his family, uh, Chuck Matthias, who we work with, super good people, uh, you know, have a great team over there. Uh, they took us to the farm out there and they said, uh, or I said, this is where we grow. This is the third generation we are doing into. So the story of that is that his father, uh, Third generation, great great grandfather, actually grandfather, borrowed the money from a moon sh- uh, from a bootlegger to start off this farming, um, and said so this is almost a three hundred and sixty coming back to it. So now we are working with you, and you become like one of our main supplier. Um, so that was a very good. Um, that is a very good partnership. I think so I'm very proud of that partnership. And the bourbon is uh, a little over two years old now, right? Yes, uh, so uh, so we have uh, two products. Uh, do, uh, we have two bourbons. One is our finished, which is a dual cask bourbon. Uh, we age into uh, th- about three years in American oak, and then sixty to ninety days in a wine cask. When we first started off, the reason why we started doing finishing was I wanted to have that. Um, like bourbon brings up a great con. So when you use con, it brings up a lot of cherry. It becomes a lot of vanilla. But always something which always fascinated me was that to have a bourbon with a little bit of a tropical character. So the reason why I wanted to have a little bit of the hint of the tropical, that's why I started using Chardonnay barrel. So to bring an extra layer of complexity on the bourbon. So that's what our dual cask uh, comes up. And just a little hint of, you will, you know, like uh, with the malolactation barrels, what we use that little bit of, of, of the tropical comes up. Now, your boondoggler, though, is even more complex. Uh, five different finishing barrels. That's a unique challenge because I know a lot of master blenders who have done three and four barrel finishes or extended maturations, whatever they like to call it. Uh, 
over in Scotland, they'll call it different things. But uh, that can really become a bit of a mess if you don't do it right, if you don't blend it well enough, right? Absolutely. I, I think so. blending is, um, is like cooking. You know, if you do a little bit over, it just becomes a mess. So what we do on a boondoggler, it's a blend of five different barrels. Uh, so we use American oak, we use French oak, and we use sherry oak. So the boondoggler starts off with two American oak, which is a um, uh, bourbon, and we have a corn and a rye. So we, we age our bourbon in a separate barrel. We age rye in a separate barrel. So that's a two American oak. Then we use used American oak. Uh, the reason why Boondoggler uh, is because bourbon has a great vanilla, a lot of caramel. But sometimes you just need a, a used barrel to bring up that complex, not that complexity onto it. So that's why we used uh, one new make, one used, uh, one uh, French oak barrel and a sherry barrel. About 20% of the sherry barrels to it. It's a real challenge to blend Fino and PX along with uh Chardonnay and Pinot Noir casks, isn't it? That's got to be tough because uh, sherry tends to overpower everything it touches. We only use 20% is our sherry cask. So in, in our 10 barrel, uh, as I am not a big fan of using a lot of uh, smaller barrels, but sherry, I use a smaller barrel. So it's it's a smaller barrel from uh, Hidalgo sherry. That's, that's where we use it. They use a smaller sherry barrels. Um, and I am, you know, because I am just trying to add a little bit of a sherry complexity to into it. So we, we only use uh, a small sherry barrel on it. Have you released your rye separately yet? I haven't seen that one. Uh, we have a, our, our finished rye. So uh, as a product line, we have uh, a dual cast bourbon. We have uh, a single estate, single barrel bourbon, which is our um, about... Uh, roughly, we are we have managed to have a proof 114, 113 to 118 proof, uh, is is our proof uh, so far. The barrels we have done. Um, then we have a double cask rye. We don't have a, a 100% non finished rye at the moment, so we just have a double cask rye, and we have Boondoggler. That's our four whiskeys. What we have. How did you learn to distill in the first place? Because it, it takes a lot of. Uh, it's not necessarily complicated to distill if you understand the mechanics of it. Uh, I barely passed chemistry class, so I sort of kind of understand. But how did you learn, having a retail background, how did you learn to distill? I think so. it's more passion. Uh, anything which you have a passion and you want to do it, you will be able to do it. So that's one of the main thing is to have a passion. Um, and then uh, when, it, when the whole project started off, um, to give you a little story on it, uh, I was not supposed to be distilling. Uh, we hired a gentleman who was supposed to distill, and he was an ex-MGP guy. So uh, we were supposed to start uh, distilling in, in July, and this gentleman who who's uh, done with all the trainings together, and uh, you know we took all the classes together. So he came up, and uh, on, uh, on July 1st, I think so, he said, and we were supposed to distill on 30th July. So the gentleman came in and said, Sid, I can't, uh, you know, this is a good project. This is a fun project, but I don't see myself fitting into a, such a smaller project because I come from a, where everything is, you know, very organized. Um, and a smaller company, you have to do everything. And I don't see myself fitting into that. Good job, buddy. You know, telling me after only about 26 days, uh, the day when we were supposed to distill. And um, so he just, he just stepped away and that and. After putting that so much of money into distillation, you know, we had all this fermenters, distillation columns, the stills, everything was standing there. Now, what do I do with those? And I, I figured out in my head, you know, said, I cannot just wait for another six months to find somebody. So we, I have to do something. That's where I started distilling. So first six months, just did everything. We just, I just did everything. Um, but then. Uh, now we have a, such a great team who did it. So I'm so proud. I mean, it gives me a, a sense of uh, achievement. Like when we send the whiskeys out to our reviews uh, at a whiskey advocate, for example, it, it scored 94 points. So it almost equals to the top shelf of the whiskeys world. Uh, we, got, we won a San Francisco double gold on that. 
and you know that was all the whiskies which was just a, so we just understanding the 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 chemistry and the distillation uh, and the passion you can do anything in this world that's a really great story and uh, i really appreciate you sharing it with us now when you go out to whiskey shows and people see the name filibuster whiskey what's the reaction that you get from it honestly um that is a very uh, a reaction is very satisfying um when somebody comes and say it's a great whiskey with the dual cast i used to get it has the that, that that little extra thing in it what is that so that's why i explain them that this is this is finished in a wine barrel uh and it's just because it ha- has a hint of that character so which is that's what it it gets that and the name gets them to take a look at you but the taste is what gets them to buy it a second time right absolutely you know i mean uh, with, with a smaller company with still having a growth uh in this time um is is i think so because the juice is great um you know we don't we don't have so much a marketing budget that we can uh everything what has been is a word of mouth more or less uh you know we have a very uh, a very small budget i think so it, it the budget is like we don't have a marketing budget i cannot just go out and do it so people like you have supported us uh people like uh, some of the other good uh, reviewers have have given an honest review so that honest review has sometimes just worked very well now working in virginia which is a control state as well as your home market how has it been working with the uh, state liquor control board there to uh, get your whiskies out to uh, the public till you don't get in it's not good but once you what's you once you get in to virginia it's it's great to be there you know you own that shelf space so once you get into that virginia and you have that shelf space nobody can take it from you so if if it gets run out it automatically uh, replenishes and it's in the state so virginia has been great uh, as working uh, with the state and working with them um there there's some good people uh, some great help out there uh, I, i think so i just love virginia now you've been one of the distilleries that has been able to stay open throughout the pandemic but i can't imagine it's been easy it is tough um but one of the most important factor uh which gives very satisfying is i have not had anybody let go so everybody who is working who had been working with us we have everybody in um uh, we had to reduce our hours a little bit uh but that was significantly nothing you know technically so i think so for me pandemic was that i still have everybody in my uh who who was working with us so that gives a very satisfying that i was i'm still able to keep everybody uh and give everybody a job filibusters whiskies are available in 16 states and of course the district of columbia there are other distilleries in washington as well republic restoratives 18 distilling founding spirits and of course the one that will be moving into the old Joseph A Magnus site as well as George Washington's distillery at Mount Vernon just outside the district i have a feeling the tasting rooms will be busy this election week assuming public health restrictions allow that's whiskey cast in depth brought to you by mortlock whiskey's best kept secret Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The what I'm tasting this week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Manassas, Virginia is just outside of Washington, about half an hour or so. And KO Distilling in Manassas has just released its first bottled in bond Distillers Reserve bourbon to celebrate the 400th anniversary of distilling in America. As always, it's bottled at 50% ABV. The nose has notes of tobacco, charred oak, leather, honey, and hints of spices. The taste has touches of caramel and honey 
balanced by black pepper and chili powder spices, with hints of tobacco, leather, and oak tannins in the background. The finish is long and sweet, with touches of spices and charred oak. I'm scoring KO Distilling's Bottled and Bond Distillers Reserve a 91. I mentioned the new Immortal Rye Whiskey from Few Spirits a few weeks ago. It was reduced to bottling strength with 8 Immortals Tea from The Tea Spot in Denver, and I received a sample the other day. It's bottled at 46.5% ABV. The nose is aromatic and warm with a nice herbal touch, along with hints of baking spices, peaches, and dark chocolate. The taste blends those herbal notes with intense rye spices, along with hints of honey and tree fruits that come alive as the spices start to fade. The finish is long with a nice balance of herbal notes, tree fruits, lingering spices, and oak. I'm scoring Fuse Immortal Rye an 89. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first... Our tasting notes this week are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. They're just about to release the next batch of Penny's Proof. It's a preview of Sagamore Spirit Whiskey that's distilled on site in Baltimore. Last year, they sold out the first release of samples in just a few hours. The only way to find out when and how to get your hands on this year's batch is to join Sagamore Spirit's Whiskey Thieves. Sign up today at sagamorespirit.com. I tasted all eight of the single malts in this year's special releases lineup from Diageo's Classic Malts, and I'll be posting my tasting notes for all eight in the coming days at the WhiskeyCast website. But since a couple of listeners expressed interest in specific distilleries, let's start off with the Pityvake 30-year-old, distilled in 1989 and finished in First Fill X bourbon casks. It's bottled at 50.8% ABV, and the nose is fruity with touches of pears, pineapples, and banana, along with hints of linseed oil and vanilla in the background. The taste has an oily and thick mouthfeel with an intense fruity tartness and hints of white pepper, linseed oil, vanilla, and honey. Adding a few drops of water boosts the sweetness and opens up a hint of butterscotch, along with giving the spices an extra kick. The finish is medium length and slightly tart, with touches of citrus fruits and honey sweetness. I'm scoring the 2020 release of Pityvake 30-Year-Old a 94. Moving younger on the age statement ladder, We also had a request for notes on the Mortlock 21-year-old. It's finished in a combination of Pedro Jimenez and Oloroso sherry casks and bottled at 56.9% ABV. The nose starts off calm and soothing with touches of lime zest, shortbread cookies, and a beefiness that comes out slowly, along with a touch of oak. The taste has that classic Mortlock chewiness and peppery character, along with dried fruits and hints of potpourri and oak tannins, while adding some water opens up touches of cooked plums, dates, and mulled wine. The finish is very long, aromatic, and savory, with hints of beefiness, spices, and oak. I'm scoring the 2020 release of Mortlock 21-year-old a 94. And the youngest whiskey in this year's special releases series is also a first, an eight-year-old Talisker finished in Caribbean rum casks. It's bottled at 57.7% ABV. The nose has a good balance of sweetness and maritime notes with touches of brine and seaweed complemented by grilled fruits and hints of brown sugar and molasses cookies. The taste starts off peppery at first with hints of tree fruits and brine in the background and a subtle touch of driftwood campfire smoke for a luscious and well-rounded flavor. Water opens up the fruitiness while not drowning out the spices. I'm scoring the Talisker 8-year-old Caribbean rum cask finish a 94. 
The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 3,000 different whiskeys from around the world. You can check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. Hiya, Mark. How's my favorite New Jersey Red Breast fan doing? <sighs> Look, I'm going to address the elephant in the room right away. We both know your podcast is dying for a co-host, and I know just the lad who can be the Robin to your Batman. How's that for dropping a hint? That is Robin Redbreast, the new spokesbird for Redbreast. Thanks to our friends at Redbreast for that special greeting this week. And no, Robin is not going to become a co-host. But you will be hearing more from him on the show in the coming weeks. Right now, it's time to announce our November Whiskey Club of the Month. We're going to go halfway around the world this time. Congratulations to the Nakata Bangkok Whiskey Club in Bangkok, Thailand. Club President Andy Perez sent us this email. Greetings, Mark. We're a whiskey club of about 22 expats trapped and living in Bangkok, Thailand, representing nine nationalities, who get together every Friday and sometimes hump day to carouse, commune, consume, and most importantly, taste whiskey. As you probably know, Thailand is doing very well during COVID, and although we are, quote, trapped in paradise, the weekly club meetings and your podcast, in all caps there, have been vital in maintaining everyone's morale and good spirits. We would be honored and humbled to get a shout-out from you when possible to make sure that we still exist. Best regards, Andy. Well, Andy, not only are you getting that shout-out now, but we're going to send you two dozen Whiskey Cast Glencairn glasses to use at those Friday night tastings. Now, if you're in a whiskey club and you'd like to nominate your club for our Whiskey Club of the Month honors, all you have to do is use the contact form at whiskeycast.com like Andy did. Tell us a bit about your club, and if your club has a website or is active on social media, we'll be glad to add a link on the Whiskey Clubs page at the WhiskeyCast website. We do roll over nominations from month to month, so you only need to send us a nomination once. And we announce a new winner on the first episode of each month. Once again, congratulations to the Nakata Bangkok Whiskey Club in Bangkok, Thailand, November's Whiskey Club of the Month. And thanks to Glencairn Crystal for helping us support whiskey clubs around the world. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. Earlier, I mentioned our Friday Happy Hour webcast the other night with Wright Thompson on his new book, Pappy Land, the story of Julian Van Winkle III and his fight to keep the Pappy Van Winkle legacy alive. You can read my review of Pappy Land at the WhiskeyCast website. Richard Dankovic shared this comment on the massive markups we see for Pappy Van Winkle whiskeys, both at retailers and on the secondary market. I just can't get past the ridiculous point to which the aftermarket has driven the price of Pappy to. It's a shame thinking about the fact that Julian isn't seeing a dime out of the money these scalpers are charging for a bottle of the stuff. Wright Thompson told us the secondary market makes both Julian and his son Preston madder than hell, but not because they don't see any money from it. He doesn't think the whiskey's worth that. Oh, no. And it infuriates him. He thinks it's worth what it's priced at. He thinks a bottle of Old Rip should be fifty nine ninety nine. And, I mean, in the world I want to live in, I have Old Rip in my decanter instead of Maker's Mark. I mean, that's what I would like to do is just go home and that's what you drink. Marcel Dion posted this comment on our Facebook page, Loved Wright's Stories. Now, to find the book. Marcel also noted that he's going through cancer treatment right now with this comment. I'll be opening a special bottle of scotch, Golder Still, when my radiation therapy ends at Christmas, doing Movember with Gusto again. 
And if you're not aware of it, Movember is a campaign to build awareness for prostate cancer research and funding. Marcel, best of luck health-wise. Please let us know how that golder still tastes when you crack it open. On that note, I do want to pass along our best wishes to the Scotch trooper, Brett Ferenz, who has been undergoing treatment for pancreatic cancer. He noted this week on Facebook that his doctors at the Mayo Clinic found that his cancer may have spread, and they are doing more testing, but he has returned home to Georgia for additional treatment. Also, our good friend Bridget Kalin is recovering well from breast cancer surgery in Louisville a couple of weeks ago. Bridget is a musician who has not been able to perform almost all year long because of COVID-19. And like Brett, there is a GoFundMe campaign to help her and her family with their expenses. I know times are tough, but if you have the ability to help either of them or someone else close to you, please consider it. In the meantime, if you have a question, a suggestion, or anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast, the email address, comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. And since we focused on Washington, D.C. earlier, let me give you another good whiskey-related reason to visit the city. It turns out the home of red tape and regulation actually has some pretty consumer-friendly liquor rules. The District of Columbia is not a state, but Washington's city government has home rule status, which makes it a lot easier to change regulations than trying to get things changed at the state level. For instance, D.C. loosened the rules during COVID-19 to allow bars and restaurants to not only offer carry-out cocktails and bottle sales, but also to allow home delivery within D.C. as long as there's a prepared food order included. But here's the big reason that D.C. is a hotbed for whiskeys from all over the place. If a retailer, bar, or restaurant wants to stock a specific whiskey, or any other alcoholic beverage for that matter, that is not available through a local wholesaler, D.C. regulations let them get a permit that allows them to source that whiskey from anywhere outside of the district and bring it in legally, including directly from a distillery. And that includes so-called vintage whiskeys. It's the reason why Jack Rose Dining Saloon and a handful of other D.C. bars are able to offer things like pre-prohibition whiskeys. It's also why you're more likely to find whiskeys that are available in D.C. from, say, West Coast craft distillers that might otherwise be available only at stores near the distillery or even only at the distillery itself. Just something to think about when you're making plans for your next vacation when the pandemic ends. If there's something you'd like to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. We love to hear from you. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. At Doers, we love a good story, and that's why we're always writing new chapters. Like our illegal smooth finished in mezcal casts, with notes of sliced green pepper and a wisp of smoke, a world's first illegal brings cultures together for something truly unique. 
As a 174-year-old brand, we could rest on our laurels. Instead, we'd much rather continue writing. Because when you keep telling the same old story, that's when people stop listening. The search never ends. But it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2020, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please. Stay safe.